Well, here we are. Bible Boom. unpacked. Super Boom. stoked, man. Last week, we looked at all those plagues and Pharaoh saying yes. no to God. And this week, we'll take a look at the final plague, which is kind of cool. Yes. Yeah, yeah it's exciting. I'm actually really excited for yeah. this. Uh, it's a beautiful part of the story. It's a confronting. Yeah. It's a dramatic. It's an epic moment in the story. But it is an incredible uh, insight into who God uh, yeah. is. So I'm looking forward to it. We're going to be jumping into it straight away. It's, we're going to start in chapter 11. We've got Alicia reading the Bible uh, for us. So hopefully, you've got your Bibles open in front of you. Alicia, take it away. Awesome. What's up? I'm Nikki from Grade 10 Girls and today we'll be reading Exodus chapter 11 verses 1 to 10. I'll give you a sec to find that in your Bibles. Exodus is the second book of the Bible near the beginning. If you're not sure, you can ask the person next to you or a leader and they'll help you find it. Let's get started. Now the Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague onto Pharaoh and on Egypt. After that, he will let you go from here, and when he does, he will drive you out completely. Tell the people that the men and the women alike are to ask their neighbours for articles of silver and gold. The Lord made Egyptians favourably disposed toward the people, and Moses himself was highly regarded in Egypt by Pharaoh's officials and by the people. So Moses said, This is what the Lord says. About midnight, I go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn in son in Egypt will die. From the firstborn son of the Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn son of the female slave who was at her hand mill, and all the firstborn of the cattle as well. There'll be loud wailing throughout Egypt, worse than there has ever been and will ever be again. But among the Israelites, not a dog will bark at any person or animal. Then you will know that the Lord has made a distinction between Egypt and Israel. All of these officials of yours will come to me, bowing down before and saying, and saying, Go you and all the people follow, who follow you. After that I will leave. Then Moses, hot with anger, left Pharaoh. The Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh refused, will refuse to listen to you, so that my wonders may be multiplied in Egypt. Moses and Aaron performed all these wonders before Pharaoh, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he would not let the Israelites go out of his country. Awesome. Well, thank you, Alicia, for that. Oh, yeah. Crazy part of the Bible, man. Crazy yeah. part of the Bible. But before we even get into that, yes. I have a bit of a oh, an apology to make to you. Monday yeah. night, yeah, Monday yes. night, I don't see you very often, but Monday night, I had my mates around yes. here after playing touch footy, and we made a bit of noise, and we watched a movie, Big Hero 6. Kept, kept me awake yeah, I did. watching the movie. I did, I did. Yes. So I am sorry for that, but Big Hero 6, we watched that movie, Great movie, guys. Definitely check it out if you haven't seen it. Yes. But I will say, the villain in that story, I do feel kind of sorry for him. Because like, yeah. while, while he does some bad things, some really bad things, he's got a bit of a sad backstory. So I kind of empathise with him. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I think a lot of the villains that we kind of watch in movies yeah. are like that. I think I feel similarly. Big Hero 6, love that movie. I do feel empathy for that yeah. uh, character. And I think that's the way in a lot of the characters that are in our uh, movies, we do feel a sense of empathy. They have redeemable characteristics yeah. that we kind of lean in towards. We might want them to lose in the long run because they do some bad things. They yeah. are villains. But at the same time, there's an emotional pull kind of for sure. uh, towards them. But I want to say... In the story of Exodus, Pharaoh is not like that. No. Like he's not a character that has redeemable characteristics that we're meant to feel empathy for. No. No, he actually is the worst, I would say. And what yes. I did say last week, guys, is that sometimes we are like Pharaoh. We go toe-to-toe -to -toe with God. We, we actually will be there. Am I rejecting God? Yes. Pharaoh's not your average citizen, is he? He's, he's the worst of the worst. Nah, like this guy's pure yeah. evil. I mean, maybe it's helpful to think of him kind of like the Hitler of mm. the day, except in some regards, like he's even worse because he's like picking up where his kind of predecessor left yeah. off. Maybe his father possibly, but the previous Pharaoh. I mean, this guy is a generational psycho. Yeah. I mean, he's trying to completely wipe out an entire race. Mm. He's killing on mass children. He's enslaving an entire people group. And he's not interested in listening to what God has to say because he likes the fact that he is oppressing these people. He's yeah. not your kind of lovable Disney villain that has redeemable characteristics, yeah. you know, like in Big Hero 6. And so when we read here, and we, uh, as we have done in previous weeks, and as we uh, read here in chapter 11, verse 10, that God hardens Pharaoh's 
hard. I mean, it's good that that raises questions for us around what's happening in here. And if you're asking those questions, they're good questions to sure. explore. But it's worth kind of remembering that this isn't a Mother Teresa-like character that God's kind of stepped in and stopped from kind of doing good. Now, this is a narcissistic, racist man, hell-bent on oppressing God's people. And God just moves him along a pathway that he's already himself really committed into. Yeah, but it is interesting though, because uh, we read in verse 5 that Pharaoh wasn't the only one who suffers um, from God. So if you yes. read with me in verse 5 there, yes. it says, Every firstborn son in Egypt will die, from the firstborn son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn son of the female slave who is at her handmill, and all the firstborns of the cattle as well. Mm. So what about all the people that... Um, that also lose their sons in Egypt, all those people there. How's that fair that they suffer for what Pharaoh did as well? Yeah, yeah, great uh, question, an important question. I think in many ways this is the kind of moment where it feels like God's judgment is yeah. like excessively kind of harsh. And it kind of brings, maybe for you, it brings into the question, is God kind of good? You know, it's one thing to bring judgment on an evil mm. Pharaoh, but what about all those innocent uh, Egyptians? Yeah. But I think it's worth questioning the reality of that are the egyptians really that innocent you know because aside from a couple of midwives from uh, chapters ago and pharaoh's daughter who may have only rescued moses really just for herself yeah. uh, and they're all part of a previous generation we don't really read of anyone kind of standing up for the israelites there's no kind of rallies or protests in the street kind of you know like uh, championing the cause of these oppressed People, there's no revolution to overthrow the tyrant Pharaoh who is so evil and racist. Mm. Now, the Egyptians seem pretty comfortable with the situation, happy to benefit from the racism that their leaders have kind of promoted. And the only time that we read that they actually stand up to tell Pharaoh to do something else is when they start losing yeah. out. And, they, and we saw that last week. And they're like, hey, Pharaoh, you've got to stop this because we're losing, man. We're going we're gonna to fully lose out. You know, their reason to go to Pharaoh, it's not motivated by compassion and love for the Israelites. It's motivated by self-interest. Yeah. If, if they could continue to oppress the Israelites but not get the judgment coming, then they'd continue to do it. The truth is, these aren't fundamentally good people mm -hmm. who kind of got caught up in some sort of cosmic power struggle between God and Pharaoh. They're not innocent of the oppression of God's people. They're part of it. They've been driving it just as much as Pharaoh has. Yeah, and it definitely does raise questions when you look at the situation through the lens because it makes the final plague that we read about um, read about in these chapters, it's kind of the final moment of judgment yeah. from God. It's God bringing down judgment on the people who deserve the justice that's being brought against them, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. I mean, this this final plague, it's, a, it's the judgment that God has promised. Plague after plague yeah. after plague. He's been saying judgment is coming and yeah. it's judgment that's coming upon a scum of the earth leader an oppressive racist genocidal maniac yeah. who makes the worst leaders of today kind of look a lot like saints in comparison yeah. and to a group of people who have had little to no shame in being part of this horrific treatment of god's people yeah, yeah it's definitely. judgment coming and it's right and it's deserved for what they've done yeah for sure for sure but even before we actually see that there's this kind of weird kind of ritual that we see take place at the start of chapter 12 mm. that's um, we actually read about this kind of sacrifice ritual that all like takes place and it's all surrounding this lamb so the death of a lamb is kind of the center of it yeah that's right and it, it like when you read it it's all sort of pretty unusual yeah. sort of stuff it's very strange and especially i think for us in 2020 like it's it's culturally very different, very different. Uh, and, and so it, it is all a little bit kind of weird, but it's a, a really significant mm. moment in, uh, in fact, the whole of the Bible, but particularly in this Exodus story. So we actually got our recon uh, guys Love this them. week to take us through this sort of unique ritual, but significant ritual here in chapter 12. So yeah, take it awesome. away, recon boys. The Lord spoke to Aaron and Moses saying, Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. The animals you choose must be year old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the fourteenth day of the month when all the lambs must be slaughtered at twilight. 
Then the blood is to be put on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I'll pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. For seven days you are to eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, remove the yeast from your houses, for whoever eats anything with yeast in it from the first day through the seventh must be cut off from Israel. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly and another one on the seventh day. Do no work at all on these days, except to prepare food for everyone to eat. That is all you may do. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. In the first month, you are to eat bread made without yeast. From the evening of the 14th day until the evening of the 21st day. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and side of the door frame and will pass over that doorway and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. After hearing this, the Israelites did just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. Well, thanks, Recon Boys. That was awesome. And it mm. certainly is culturally different, but it's a pretty key moment, isn't it? Yeah, it's uh, it's an incredible kind of moment. And there's so much in yeah. uh, these verses here that we could kind of uh, unpack from this ritual mm. that's going to be known as the uh, Passover. In fact, I reckon we could do uh, an entire series just unpacking uh, all the significance of those moments, the significance of the family involvement, the type of food that mm. is uh, to be used, the fact that they're to dress in a way that demonstrates they're trusting in a promise keeping God the fact that it's meant to be something that will continually be celebrated as a remembrance for this moment there's lots to kind of unpack there but there's there's just a couple of things that I want to kind of draw out uh, for this moment and for this talk from this faithful night and you can certainly ask lots of questions about those other things love to post them in the comments or if you're live uh, at, at youth will there be moments you can ask questions uh, about the Passover but here's a couple of things that I want to kind of raise that we see See in this ritual that this ritual points us towards yeah. and the first of those is that the Israelites are guilty too mm. that's the first thing that we kind of see here they are to fear the judgment that's coming because they deserve death just as much as the Egyptians See, the fact that they have to go through this in whole process demonstrates that they need to fear the judgment that's coming. If there's no need for them to fear the judgment, there's no need for all of this. Their houses don't need to be marked. Their racial identity would be enough to uh, avoid what's coming. But they need to fear the judgment because the truth is yeah. they're sinners deserving of death. And so the Israelites, they've got to put blood on the doorpost because they're just as guilty as the Egyptians. The blood is placed there on their homes, not because God doesn't know who's inside the house, but because he does know who's inside the house. Sinners inside. And it brings us then to the other key factor that we notice in this uh, chapter here that this Passover shows us, and that is that God makes a way. The Israelites are guilty too, but God makes a way. See, the death of the lamb here, as gruesome as it all is, is significant because the lamb is a substitute for the child. 
See, if blood was simply just marking the house, well, they could have used anything, just put some red paint up uh, on the doorposts. But the blood is a sign that sacrifice has been made, that a substitute has been offered. So it's here in these chapters that we see God's grace and mercy, his incredible love for his people pour out because he makes a way, one life for another, the life of the perfect lamb in place of the firstborn son. See, the Israelites need a substitute to die in their place if they're to avoid the judgment of death. The blood of the lamb here in chapter 12 is shed so that God would pass over the house, having counted their sin as being paid for. See, judgment is coming. The death count at the end of the night, it's going to be the same in every home. The question is, will it be a son or will it be a lamb? Yeah, wow. See, I can't even fathom what that night 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 would have been like what a crazy kind of event that takes place and we're actually going to look at what goes down in in um in in exodus 12 verses 29 to 36 and we're going to have connor read that for us so take that away connor hello my name is daniel and today i will be reading from exodus 12 verse 29 to 36 exodus is the second book in the bible um towards the start and if you're having any trouble finding it Um, Please ask a leader or someone next to you and they'll help you find it. So again, Exodus 12, verse 29 to 36. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner, who was in the dungeon, and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night, And there was loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Up, leave my people, you and the Israelites. Go worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and herds, as you have said, and go, and also bless me. The Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave the country, for otherwise, they said, we will all die. So the people took their dough before the yeast was added and carried it on their shoulders in kneading troughs, wrapped in clothing. The Israelites did as Moses instructed and asked the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold and for clothing. The Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people, and they gave them what they asked for. So they plundered the Egyptians." Well, thanks for that, Connor. Yeah. Yeah, what a crazy event. It must have been a crazy morning as well the next morning. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to even completely fathom what no. that moment would have been like. Yeah. Well, we've had a lot of moments even this year where we sort of come together uh, as, a, as a nation and sort of shared a common uh, solidarity over various kind of events. Yeah. But that, that morning... Uh, where it says every home and the wailing and the crying and the devastation that would have been there. I mean, yeah. it's hard to kind of kind of get your head around what it would have been like with all that death that's mm. taken place. And that question then that we raised before the reading now sits right there in front of us and would have been there right in front of every kind of home. Was it a lamb or was it a child who had died? This is the devastation that has come it's the final straw for pharaoh uh, and for the egyptians and then we see so keen now are the egyptians for the israelites to kind of get out and they give gold and silver and valuables to them the devastation that has finally been kind of wreaked because of this final judgment is just is incredible it's driving a remarkable response and so as a result of what has been an extraordinary and devastating night is that the people are finally set free we see that they can now go and worship the lord at the slavery and the chains of slavery have been broken they've taken gold and silver and valuables with them they can now leave God has set them free from egyptian slavery so that they might worship him it's an extraordinary kind of moment but it's important to remember here in this moment that the people of israel they walk out of egypt not because fundamentally they're good people but because they took the way that god offered a lamb had taken their place yeah it is one of the most um um 
um, remarkable moments in the Old Testament, and not just because of the uh, significance in the book of Exodus, but also what it points towards, because uh, uh, we've been unpacking it quite a bit in this series about how this kind of points towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, and in, in many ways, this is almost like the pinnacle moment yeah. of the story that kind of points us towards uh, mm. the story of Jesus, because much like the Egyptians and the Israelites, you and I, we're not fundamentally good people either and we like to think we are but we're not and deep down we know just how guilty we are of being selfish of lying of cheating and doing things we know are wrong now we like to kind of dismiss these things as though they're not that important but they are and the bible tells us we're guilty of what it calls sin a failure to live the right way the way that our god creator king has intended for us. And when we stop to think about uh, our lives, how many times in frustration and anger mm. have you yelled kind of horrible things at your sibling or thought about yelling hor- horrible things at your sibling or your parents? How many times have we lied to make others think better about ourselves, to get us out of trouble? How many times have we failed to respect our leaders, refusing to do what our parents or teachers or even our youth leaders are asking us to do? How many times have we turned a blind eye to those who are being bullied at school or being mistreated in our community? How many times have we said things about others behind their backs or been part of conversations, bad-mouthing and damaging people's reputations, our teachers, our bosses, our parents, maybe even our peers? We do this stuff all the Mm. time. Why? Well, because we're not fundamentally good people. As the Bible constantly reminds us, we're sinful, broken people. We reject God. We live for ourselves and we trample over others to get what we want and we do it all the time. And the message of the Bible is that the consequences for that is that we deserve to die. We read in Romans 6, verse 23, that it tells us the wages of sin is death. In other words, the consequences for our sin, the judgment and punishment for our sin is death. We deserve that judgment. We deserve that punishment for rejecting God and failing to honor Him as Lord. We are guilty. Like the Israelites... The Egyptians, we are guilty. But then the incredible news of the gospel is God makes a way. Just like here in Exodus, God makes a way. You know, in the book that we were uh, reading and looking at uh, in our last The Bible Unpacked series, uh, 1 Peter, Peter writes these words. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. T.S. Peter writes here, Jesus is our Passover lamb. He was sacrificed as our substitute. See, we all deserve to die because of our rebellion against God. But Jesus has died in our place. His blood, as it were, is placed over our lives so that God would pass over our sin when he comes in judgment. See, the truth is the body count at the end of our lives, like here in Exodus, is going to be the same. The question is, will it be yours or will it be Jesus's, the Lamb of God? You know, if you're exploring uh, kind of what Christianity is all about, then this is it right here. God has made a way. We are guilty, but God has made a way. A way for you to escape the punishment of death that your sin deserves. And it is through his son, Jesus, as your substitute, who died your death. The message of the Bible is take that way. Come to Jesus, receive the gift of grace offered to you. Not because you deserve it. You're guilty, just like everyone. But because God in his mercy holds it out to you in his son, Jesus. And if you are a follower of Jesus, if you have come to him and you've received his forgiveness, 
his life as a substitute for yours. If you have the assurance of life eternal forever with Jesus, that death can no longer hold you, then remember what you have been rescued for. You've been called out of darkness, out of slavery to sin, so that you might worship God, so that your whole life might be dedicated to the one who gave up his life for you. How you going at living for the one who gave up his life for you? How you going at worshiping God, at praising him for what he's done for you, at telling the world of the incredible sacrifice that he made for you? How you going at running from the sin, the slavery to sin that he has rescued you from? Because you've been brought out of slavery to sin and into a life of the most incredible freedom found in serving King Jesus. Yeah, wow. What an incredible part of the Bible. And how good is it that it points to our Savior, Savior. Jesus? Awesome. How about we pray, guys? Mm. Yeah, dear Lord, I thank you for this part of the Bible and just how incredible your rescue plan for your people was out of Exodus. And I thank you for your son, Jesus. I thank you that he is our Passover lamb and that we have been saved from the slavery of sin by him dying on the cross for us. I pray that we'll be able to live our lives in a way that brings glory to you and, and brings thanks to Jesus for what he did for us. Thank you for how incredible you are. I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Ah, oh, man, it's been so good. It's been awesome. Uh, to be reminded of how incredible Jesus is and his sacrifice yeah, for us. And if you are exploring Christianity and you want to know some more, you want to ask more questions, yeah. do let us know. Hit us up on the socials, post uh, comments. We'd love to hear from you. If you're live at uh, Christ Central uh, tonight, then we would love you to come up and ask questions. There's yeah. going to be people around that you can kind of have a chat to if you want to explore uh, some more of that. Because the truth is, this message of the gospel is incredible and it is life transforming transforming and we want you to know mm. this incredible truth so definitely ask your questions uh, and continue to kind of explore this but yeah. for us for That's now awesome. we'll see you later see you later guys yo oh, that was the best episode yet oh let's try that again <laughs> <laughs> hey hope you like that video yeah. uh and like and subscribe uh check out some other <laughs> content uh yeah. that we've got there let others know about the pack five movement awesome. but from us for now Peace out.